100 I did in 17 months for President Bush. So despite the needs of the federal judiciary, as evidenced by Chief Judge Moreno's recent letter, I would ask unanimous consent that be made part of the record, the conclusion of my remarks. Without objection. I would only note that the delays in confirmation of President Obama's consensus nominees, nominees agreed to by both Republicans and Democrats and blocked then by Republicans, that's done to the detriment of all Americans. Most people, when they go into court, don't go in and say, well, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. They're just an American seeking justice. And the court doors are closed. They're closed because the United States Senate won't allow the confirmation of the judges who could open the doors. That, Mr. President, is wrong. It's a stain on the judiciary, but I'd also say it's a stain on this body. And I had asked my full statement be made part of the record. Without objection. And I uh, suggest you have to inform, but, but ask unanimous consent that the time be equally uh, charged to both parties. Without objection, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kakao.
objection? Today, the Senate will vote on the nomination of Paul Engelmeyer to be U.S. District Judge, Southern District, New York, and Ramona Manglona to be judge for the District Court of the Northern Mariana Islands. The seat to which Mr. Engelmeyer uh, is being considered has been deemed a judicial emergency. With this vote, we will have confirmed 29 Article III judicial nominees, 18 having been for judicial emergencies. Ms. Mangone's uh, confirmation vote marks the second Article IV judicial confirmation this year, and I'm pleased that we're moving forward to fill these two vacancies. We continue to make good progress in processing President Obama's judicial nominees. As of today, the Senate has confirmed 60 percent of President Obama's nominees since the beginning of his presidency, and this does not include the two Supreme Court justices nominated by President Obama. As I'm sure my colleagues recall, those nominations consumed a considerable amount of time in the committee and on the Senate floor, as you would expect for people being nominated to the Supreme Court. During this Congress, the Judiciary Committee has held hearings on more than 72 percent of the President's nominees. Another hearing is scheduled to take place this Wednesday. During the comparable time period for President Bush, only 64 percent of President Bush's nominees had hearings by this time. We have also reported 64 percent of the judicial nominees compared to only 56 percent of President Bush's nominees. Let me say just a few words about Mr. Engelmeyer and Judge Mangalona. Mr. Engelmeyer graduated summa cum laude, Harvard University, 83. He then graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Law School, 1987. Following law school, the nominee clerk for Judge Patricia Wald, U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for District of Columbia, and then for Justice Thurgood Marshall of the Supreme Court. After his clerkships, Mr. Engelmeyer joined the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York as Assistant U.S. Attorney. In 1994, he became an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States. In 2000, the nominee entered private practice with Wilmer Hale and was later named partner in charge of New York office. The American Bar Association Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary has given Mr. Engelmeyer a unanimous, well-qualified rating. I support this nomination and congratulate him on his professional accomplishments. A uh, few words on Judge Mangalona. Uh, she received her Bachelor's of Arts degree from the University of California, Berkeley, 1990. In 96, she graduated from the University of New Mexico Law School. Following law school, the nominee clerk for the Superior Court of the Commonwealth of North Mariana Islands. She then worked in the Attorney General's office, and in 2002, the governor appointed her Attorney General for Northern Mariana Islands. In 2003, she was appointed to serve as an associate judge for the Northern Mariana Islands Superior Court. During her time on the Superior Court, she had also served as Judge Pro Tem for the Guam Superior Court and the Guam Supreme Court. The American Bar Association Standing Committee on the Federal Judiciary has rated Judge Magnola unanimously qualified. I also support this nomination and congratulate her on her professional accomplishments. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Majority Leader. Well, we have um, an unusual situation. It's all Looks nice outside today, sun shining, but earlier today a sum. And if you looked out the window, we're outside, you had some violent storms here. They're all over the area. We've got senators stuck in airplanes uh, trying to get out of New York. We've got one senator driving from the Midwest is stuck in Richmond, Virginia now. So I think it would be to everyone's interest. And I apologize for people who worked hard to get back here today. But I think it would be to everyone's interest that we not have a vote tonight. We have... Uh, a lot of people simply would miss the vote and literally kept it open for a matter of hours. Um, I, again, apologize for people who, who came here to vote, but I would um, I think this is the best thing to do. I've 
spoken to the Republican leader, and this is, the, this is what we should do. So I ask unanimous consent that the vote scheduled for tonight be vitiated, that on Tuesday, that's tomorrow, July 26th, at 12.15, the Senate vote on go to executive session and resume consideration of nominations calendar number 83 and 84. There will be two minutes for debate equally divided in the usual form. Upon the use or yielding back of the time, the Senate proceed to vote with no intervening action or debate on calendars number 83 and 84 in that order. That the motion to reconsider be considered made and laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. That no further motion be in order. That any related statements be printed in the record. And the President be immediately notified to sense action and the Senate then resume the legislative session. Is there an objection? Without objection, so ordered. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Yield to me for just a brief second. Yes. The Majority Leader. Mr. President, we're not in a quorum call. We are in a quorum call. I would ask consent that be vitiated. Without objection. Mr. President, I now ask you and consent that we proceed to pre morning business uh, for, and allow Senator to speak for up to 10 minutes each. And we'd be in morning business until 7 o'clock tonight. Without objection. And now, Mr. President. The Senator from. I, uh, I wish to speak uh, uh, as in, if in morning business, uh, and I certainly will not take the, the 10 minutes that uh, the majority leader has requested, uh, because I know the senator from Alabama is eager to speak. But I, I just want to make sure that I understand where we are with regard to the debt ceiling. Um, I, I have here an article from The Hill dated uh, yesterday, and it points out um, it heard the same thing in the speech that, that the rest of the nation heard when the President spoke. The President said he would be willing to work on any plans, any plans that lawmakers brought to him over the weekend. The President went on to say, quote, the only bottom line I have is that we have to extend this debt ceiling through the next election into 2013, unquote, President Obama said. Now, I asked my colleagues, what does the election of 2012 have to do with the debt ceiling? What does it have to do with deciding to pay our obligations after August the 2nd? What does it have to do with avoiding the calamity that we've all heard about from both sides of the aisle and certainly from the administration. It strikes me as very odd that most debt ceiling extensions have been about seven months during a, a decades long period and for some reason because of the election of 2012, the President of the United States wants to extend the deadline past that election into 2013. I think it makes Americans wonder if the president is, pay, is playing politics with this very important issue. The president went on to say in the press conference that we all listened to that he wondered if the Republicans were able to say yes to any agreement. Now that was the president on Friday evening. And now we come to Washington, D.C. today uh, with the clock ticking, eight days away from uh, a, a supposed debacle. And I read in, uh, in uh, today's Wall Street Journal this report by uh, Jamie Dupree. President Obama last night rejected a bipartisan deal offered to him by congressional leaders of both parties, 
which, have, would, have, which would have provided for a short-term extension of the debt limit in order to avoid a U.S. government default. The agreement involved Speaker Boehner, Senate Majority Leader Reid, and Senate GOP Leader McConnell. In fact, according to this Wall Street Journal article, staffers from Reid and McDonald's offices were working on the legislative language together on Sunday. But when Reid took the bipartisan, bicameral plan down to the White House, it was rejected by the President. Now I ask my colleagues, who is unable to say yes? The Democratic majority leader of this body said yes to a bipartisan agreement. The Republican Speaker of the House of Representatives, the leader of that majority in the other body, said yes to an agreement. Senator Reid's colleague and friend, the Republican leader, Senator McConnell, said yes to a bipartisan agreement, and then Senator Reid was given the task of taking it to the President of the United States, and the President rejected it. I think Americans have a right to ask who is unable to say yes to a bipartisan deal that gets us out of this box? Who is playing politics with this issue? The public debt is $14.2 trillion. We meet the deadline a week from tomorrow. The clock is ticking. The president had an opportunity to say yes to a bipartisan agreement endorsed by the leadership of this Congress, and yet he said no. I'm calling on this president, on my president, to do the right thing by the American people and to do the right thing for our country and for our economy and ask this bipartisan group of leaders to come back to the White House and say yes to the agreement which they offered him last night. And I, um, I thank uh, the President, I thank the Senator from Alabama for allowing me to, to um, go in front of him and I yield the floor. Well, the Senator, before he departs. The I Senator know, from Alabama. I know that we've talked about having an opportunity to digest, ex analyze, and score any kind of proposal. I understand this afternoon the majority leader, Senator Reid, said that he would propose legislation tonight and file cloture apparently tonight. Uh, and that would, uh, according to the rules of the Senate, uh, uh, move this vote up to Wednesday morning early. So um, I guess I would ask my experienced colleague, a distinguished member in the House and now in the Senate, um, that really would give us only tomorrow, one day, to digest a bill that supposedly, uh, uh, not supposedly, would indeed impact our spending trajectory for the next uh, decade. Does that cause him concern? Well, I think it, it absolutely should cause concern, uh, and, uh, and this is something that that both parties have campaigned on in the past. The, the lack of transparency, the lack of time, uh, things being, uh, being rushed through at the last minute. But, uh, but I, my, my larger point is this, that, that on Friday afternoon, the President was calling for a plan, any plan, any plan, he said, only one condition. We must be political about it. And we, we must get us past that presidential re-election in 2012. And then on Sunday night, when, when not just any plan was presented to the president, but a bipartisan plan uh, by, by both leaders in this body on behalf of their membership, and the Republican Speaker of the House said, we believe we can get this through, and the president rejected it out of hand. That, that is the larger point, but the, the point of... Uh, of the senator from Alabama is, is well taken. Uh, the legislative language is important. The, the agreement in concept is one thing. 
but as he is pointing out, the legislative language is also important. And as ranking member of the Budget Committee, he knows full well that members need time to, to see if the language actually reduce the concepts into writing that can be enforced and, and work long term to get us out of this uh, horrendous debt crisis that we're in. And I, I appreciate the gentleman's point. Thank you, um, uh, Senator Wicker. I, I really appreciate that. And I, the point that you've made is tremendously important. Uh, all year, uh, we've conducted Senate business with regard to the financial future of our country in the most troubling way, so far as I can tell. It's unlike anything we've done in our history. I would say, from a structural, systemic circumstance, this nation has never had a more serious debt problem. We are borrowing uh, 40 cents of every dollar we spend. Yes, we do have a war going on. It's costing $150 billion this year. The deficit this year will be $1,500 billion, $1.5 trillion in deficit. It's not the war. That's only about 10 percent of our deficit, unfortunately. So back in World War II, uh, we could see our way out of the war and our victory, and, then, and, and we uh, had great growth in, in, in the future. But the deficits we're accruing every day, every week, every month are significant because they're going to be hard to change. We're just spending more than we take in on a host of different programs, and we've got to change, and we can change. And if we do change and get this country back on a growth path, I think we'll be in the right, uh, right way. So I have repeatedly warned that by avoiding going through the budget process this year, a process required by law, that this Senate under the Democratic leadership explicitly refused to do. The majority leader said it would be foolish to have a budget. We now are about 820 days or so without a budget. Over two years, we've not had a budget for the United States of America, and they never even attempted to, even though a law says we should pass one by April 15th. Doesn't put anybody in jail. Maybe that's what it should have done. Maybe a bunch of people would be in jail today. Maybe we'd have a budget if we had some teeth in the act. But it's a statute of the United States that requires a budget. We've not done so. So then we began to hear the warnings six months ago that we would be reaching a point where we need to raise the debt limit, the debt ceiling that we have. Congress has said, Mr. President, you can borrow money, but only so much you can't borrow more uh, than the uh, uh, amount, 14 some odd trillion dollars. That's all. If you need to borrow more, Congress will have to appropriate it. We have the power of the purse under the Constitution. So this has been brewing. We've been heading to that. I've been warning since we haven't done our job, since the Budget Committee hasn't met about these issues, the Appropriations Committee has not met about these issues, the Finance Committee has not met about the tax uh, and, uh, uh, spend, uh, tax and uh, mandatory uh, entitlement programs that are under their jurisdiction. No work has been done all year. None. But we're told not to worry. Our leaders are going to meet a few times in secret, and this little group failed, and this group with the vice president met, and that didn't work, and then they're going to meet with the president, and that didn't work. And finally, last night, as, as uh, Senator Wicker said, it did appear an agreement was reached between the Democratic leadership and the uh, Republican leadership on a bill that at least would get us past this debt crisis. So they had the leadership agreement. I haven't read it. I don't know what's in it. I'm going to want to know what's in the bill. I have a constitutional responsibility, as do the other 99, 98 senators here, to make a good judgment on it. But it is odd that after all of that and a bipartisan agreement was reached, the president walked away from it. And he's going to blame now Speaker Boehner, who produced a budget 
The Republican House produced a far-reaching historic budget that would actually change the debt trajectory of our country, put us on the right path, the path to restoring prosperity, the creation of jobs, because this debt is so large, it's a wet blanket, as Speaker Boehner said. I called it an anchor, a weight that's pulling down the economy because expert economists have told us so. Not me. Experts say when you have this much debt, you lose a million jobs a year that would otherwise be created. So we've got a serious problem, and I'm not uh, uh, pleased about it. Uh, I, I've just felt all along this is exactly what's going to happen. Uh, somewhere in the back of the minds of, of the president or the leaders or somebody was the idea that they would bring up a plan at the 11th hour the 11th hour, 50th minute, bring it to the floor of the Senate, say, if you don't vote for it, members of the Senate, if you don't vote for it, members of the House, we're going to have a debt crisis and it'll all be your fault. Well, I'm not in that. I'm not going to vote for any kind of significant legislation as this is until I've had a chance to read it and think about it. And what's going to happen, I'm told, after the Majority Leader Reid produced a one-page summary of his plan this afternoon, told us not to worry. He's got a one-page summary. Trust us. And that he's going to introduce legislation tonight, and we'll vote Wednesday morning. And uh, it'll be good for America. Just do what I tell you and uh, go along and, 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 and mind your manners, and we'll get this thing taken care of. Trust me. Well, American people have been trusting Washington too long. American people know there is no justification whatsoever in this country that we are spending so much money that 40% of it has to be borrowed. They know better. They know we have no business spending $3,700 billion where we take in only $2,200 billion. That's what happened in this last election. They said, oh, these people, these Tea Party people, you know, they're not good Americans. They're angry. They, they gotta, they're mad. That's not good. You, you're bad people. Well, give me a break. Why well, shouldn't they be? If, if we had a recall election, we'd all ought to be voted out of office, I suppose. There's no way we should ever have been in this situation. So now under the pressure of the American people and fear of the next election, the president, why did he reject, it, reject this bipartisan agreement? Well, it would have required us to meet again next year and talk about more cuts because the cuts they're talking about are clearly insufficient to meet the challenge we are facing today. Clearly insufficient. We've got to do more. So if you run up your credit card too much, and you've hit the limit, and you want the limit raised, the person who's loaning the money, the American people, would like to know, have you changed your habits? Are you going to do better? Let's see a plan, a budget, a plan that gets us out of this fix. So that has been steadfastly uh, rejected by the leadership in this Senate all year, and we knew we were heading to this date. Well, so the, Senator Reid has thrown something out there. Um, let's talk about a little bit about what it appears that's in it. We've had a, the President has had a friendly press on most of the things that he's proposed. When he proposed a budget, the Democratic Senate never produced one, but by law the President uh, is to produce one. He produ every president has produced one every year. So the president produced one this year. Uh, the lowest annual deficit in that budget would be $740 billion. The highest deficit President Bush ever had was 450, and he was criticized for that. The lowest he would have in 10 years is 750, and in the 10th year, it's back over a trillion dollars. 
according to the Congressional Budget Office, analysis of his budget. So that's where we're heading. Uh, that's the kind of thing that the President has submitted to us. And you know what he said about it? He said, I'm proud of my budget. It will have America living within its means. Can you believe the President of the United States said that? That a budget, that the lowest annual deficit would be $700 plus billion dollars was living within our means? He said also, quote, it would add no more to our debt. And, and his budget director, Mr. Lou, Jack Lou, said the same thing. Actually testified to that effect before the budget committee. Breathtaking. So forgive me if I'm not buying in to a proposal on one page that was produced this afternoon that said we're going to reduce the deficit by $2.7 trillion. Forgive me if I'm not buying into that until I see it and it's been scored. That's what I think uh, ought to happen here today. By the way, You've heard the debates, and, and Speaker Boehner used this phrase, and others have used it, we want to have dollar per dollar on, uh, spending uh, to debt reduction. And what that means, excuse me, uh, debt ceiling increase. What that means, if you increase the debt ceiling and allow the government to borrow another trillion dollars, you should cut spending by one trillion dollars. That's just a rough idea. I don't know how they came up with that. That's what they came up with. Remember, the debt's still going up every year because we're still spending more than we take in. Uh, just remember, however, this is like Wimpy and old Popeye's cartoon. Wimpy said, you know, uh, give me a hamburger today and I will pay you tomorrow. What this is, is we're going to get an immediate ability to borrow $1 trillion, $2 trillion more, raising the debt limit that much, on a promise that we'll reduce spending by that amount over 10 years. Not one year, 10 years. So this is a dangerous process. This is the kind of rhetoric that's put us in a position that we are today that 40 cents of every dollar we spend is borrowed. It's what's threatening the financial future of our country, this kind of thinking in Washington. And uh, we, uh, we've got to change it. We've got to get honest about our numbers. And as a ranking Republican on the Budget Committee, I feel an obligation, and our staff is eager to see the legislative language, not a one-page outline, about what will actually happen with our spending. We want to be sure that the promises made for this bill are more accurate than pre the ones President Obama made when he said his budget would call for us to live within our means when it plainly does not. I'll just mention a couple of things at this point that jump out at me from the one-page outline that we've seen. Uh, uh, Majority Leader Reid talks about his plan would reduce spending by $2.7 trillion, but really it appears to represent a $1.2 trillion or so reduction in discretionary spending, uh, and the rest of it uh, is accrued by other, in other ways. Uh, Speaker Boehner's proposal has a discretionary spending uh, reduction of about the same. But what's obvious is that Speaker Boehner's commission that would reduce spending more is um, it has a target, a goal to reach an additional $1.8 trillion, whereas the points produced by Senator Reid uh, mentions a, a, a commission, but it has no reduction required uh, in spending as, as a part of the duty of that commission. They don't have any obligation to produce a reduction in spending. But what else is here? Part, the other factor is that we are now drawing down the cost of our 
military efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Last year we spent a little over $150 billion. This year we'll spend a little over $100 billion and the plan is to soon be down to at least $50 billion in two or three years. So over the 10 year period there'll be about eight years uh, nearly at 50 or so billion dollars spent on the war instead of 150. That's part of the plan that we've been operating along for a long time. $150 billion for the war is not baseline expenditure of the United States. It was never projected to continue at that level. So as, uh, hopefully we could bring it below $50 billion. Maybe we won't get to $50 billion. I don't know. But what is the reasonable estimate? Uh, I think uh, the House Republicans and the President said it would drop to $50 billion, and that would be uh, the baseline out there uh, for the rest of the time. That's a trillion dollars. That's a trillion dollars. So you take a trillion dollars out of the 2.7, you're down to 1.7. And another thing that's scored in that, since that trillion dollars in war cost is scored uh, uh, the way Mr. Reed scored that, which is phantom money, it's not a real reduction in baseline government spending. It's always considered to be extra war emergency spending. But he, he claims the interest savings on this money. So another $200 billion. So now you've got about $1.2 trillion right there overstating his cuts in the uh, elimination of the war. Speaker Boehner does not do that. His numbers are far more accurate and honest and realistic, uh, really the only way to properly account for them, that. Another thing I would just point out is when you talk about spending and how you account for it, you have to know what the baseline is. One reason this country is broke and is in financial crisis is because we claim we're cutting spending when we're increasing spending. So the way it works is you, the Congressional Budget Office produces an assumption that we will increase spending at the rate of inflation or some other rate over a period of years. And then if you reduce that rate of increase a little bit, politicians claim they've made savings. They've cut spending. But spending is not cut. Spending's still going up. And there are various baselines out there about how to calculate this. And it's very significant over 10 and even more so over 20 years. So you hear people saying, we're cutting spending under this plan that they're going to cut uh, uh, Speaker Boehner or, or Senator Reid, either one of those plans, I am confident, will show we're spending a good bit more money in the tenth year of their plan than we're spending today. And this is confusing to the American people. I'm really uh, convinced that the only way we can honestly compare the plans is to go back to the basic, the way families do. Do you increase your spending or you don't increase your spending based on what you spent last year? And you have a flat level, and how much do you increase it over one year, two years, ten years? How much does it go up? That would be the way to do it. And then you can compare plans. Then you can see what Senator Boehner has, Congressman Ryan had, in his budget plan for ten years. Senator Toomey proposed a, a very thoughtful ten-year budget plan, it balanced our budget. In 10 years, not easy to do, he did it. We need to be thinking like that and get away from this uh, confusing mishmash and claim that I'm saving a trillion dollars when nobody plans for us to be spending $150 billion plus on the war in Iraq and Afghanistan for the next 10 years. That money has never been projected to be spent in that fashion. Um, so, Mr. President, um, we are at a situation where it's important for the country to reach an agreement that we need to pass something that raises the debt 
ceiling in America. I hate to say that, but that is a fact. Uh, it would be too disruptive not to do that. But in exchange for that, as a part of that process, we truly need to start bringing our house into financial order. We are in disarray and disorder. If we were to do that, we can leave this a better country for our children and grandchildren. I know some just want to surge spending and then raise taxes to pay for it. Defense Department last year got about a 2% increase, 3% increase. Next year it's projected about a 2% increase on some of the budget numbers. May well not happen because we don't have even that much money. But do you know how much non-defense discretionary spending increased during this time of record deficits under President Obama's leadership, not counting the almost $900 billion in stimulus money, not counting that? Baseline, non-defense, discretionary spending increased 24%. At a time, we were suffering the biggest deficits ever. President Bush never had any increases in baseline spending like that. Never. It's just stunningly. But well, we had a huge majority in the Senate, huge majority in the House. The President wanted his investments, and he got these huge increases. And then they want to raise taxes to pay for it and keep it up there and, and maintain it. And we can't afford maintaining that kind of level. We've got to bring it back down to 2009, 2008, 2007 levels. The country's not going to go bankrupt, broke, and people not going to be thrown into the streets if uh, we make, we return to those kind of levels of spending, and if we make those tough choices like cities and counties and families are doing all over America, you know, we could get this house in order. That's what we're going to have to do. So I look forward to studying the plan put forward by the majority leader, to study the plan put forward by Speaker Boehner. Uh, the American people need time to know what's in it, what's in either one of them, what it's going to mean to us, in terms of taxes and spending and deficits, interest payments. And then Congress needs to have time to vote for it. And I again repeat my deep frustration that we have not um, conducted this in an open public debate for months now, utilizing the established Senate procedure, the regular order but have attempted to solve this big problem in secret, behind closed doors, with just a few people. I believe that is contrary to the historical understanding of the role of Congress, and I'm not happy about it. I oppose it, and I object to it, and I expect to have appropriate amount of time to consider uh, whatever plan comes forward. I thank the chair and would yield the floor. Mr. President. The senator from Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this weekend, driving around the Twin Cities, I was listening to public radio. The host of the program introduced a Republican member of the House Budget Committee, the member who I will not name to spare him or her a great deal of embarrassment, was asked about the consequences of not raising the debt ceiling. The member assured the host and listeners that Failing to raise the debt ceiling would not create a uh, default for a number of reasons. Among them was that, according to this member, that we can pay out all the Social Security checks to seniors because, and I quote, the money is in the trust fund. Well, of course, there are $2.6 trillion of assets in the trust fund, but the Social Security Trust Fund is composed entirely of Treasury notes. Allow me to quote from the Congressional Research Service. Quote, by law, Social Security revenues credited to the Trust Fund are invested in non-marketable U.S. government obligations. These obligations are physical paper documents issued to the Trust Fund and held by the Social Security Administration. 
When the obligations are redeemed, the Treasury must issue a check, a physical document, to the Social Security Trust Fund for the interest earned on the obligations. CRS continues. However, unlike a private trust that may hold a variety of assets and obligations of different borrowers, the Social Security Trust Fund can hold only non-marketable U.S. government obligations. The sale of these obligations by the U.S. government to the Social Security Trust Fund is federal government borrowing from itself and counts against the federal debt limit. Now, I have no idea what this Republican member of the House Budget Committee believes is in the Social Security Trust Fund. Stacks of $100 bills, gold bricks, warehouses of freezers with stakes in them. To me, it is shocking, shocking that a member of Congress, let alone a member of the House Budget Committee, can be so wildly ignorant of the basic workings of our government. We come here to Washington to work together to solve our nation's problems. How are we to do that if members are unwilling or unable to come to even the most rudimentary understanding of our government? None of us is immune to making mistakes. And yet we find ourselves in this moment of existential crisis with the full faith and credit of the United States being held hostage by a menagerie of ideologues who invent their own realities and are only too happy to share these fantasies with an unsuspecting public. We are playing with disaster here. Can we please just stick to the facts? And the fact is, if we don't act immediately, we will see a downgrade of our credit rating and possibly even default on our debt. Both would be entirely counterproductive to our goal of shrinking our deficits and growing our economy. We cannot control the fantasies of clueless ideologues. But we must act responsibly and do our jobs, and we must do it now. Thank you, Mr. President. I note the absence of a question.